Welcome to chapter 8. This chapter is on sexually transmitted infections and diseases. And so there's a few terms that you'll need to know because they're going to come up several times throughout the lecture. The first is an STD, which is a group of viral, bacterial, and other infections that are spread primarily by sexual behaviors. So STDs are another term for STIs. Um, and STIs are the infection itself. They don't have symptoms, but they can be passed through any sexual contact. And then an STD does show the symptoms and can also be passed through any sexual contact. So essentially, all STDs are caused by STIs. And then another term that you'll need to know is asymptomatic, which means having no noticeable symptoms despite the presence of an infectious agent. So just because you have an STI doesn't mean that you would be able to know it by noticing symptoms. Um, sometimes STIs don't have any symptoms, but you're still infected and they can still cause damage to your body. And then the next term is incubation period, and this is the time between when a person gets infected with an STD and the appearance of the physical symptoms of the illness. So each STD or STI has a different incubation period, um, and so it's important to pay attention to the incubation period so that you can know when the best time to get tested would be, ideally, although it's always a good time to get tested, but um, certain... STDs might not show until after uh, the incubation period has passed. And the next term you'll need to know is prevalence. So prevalence is the total cumulative number of cases of a disease in a given population. So like how many people in the entire United States have syphilis, for example, would be the prevalence. So you could think of prevalence as the number of new and existing sexually transmitted infections in, for example, the United States. So all of the diseases, um, new and existing, combined into one number is prevalence. Whereas incidence is just the, the new cases of a disease, so just the newest numbers in a certain time frame in a certain population. So how many people got diagnosed with HIV in 2017 in the United States, that would be the incidence. And it wouldn't include the people that already had um, HIV, which maybe they acquired in the 80s or the 90s. Um, so it's just the new cases in a certain amount of time in a certain population. So those are the key terms you'll need for this chapter. And let's go ahead and start with a historical perspective on STIs. All right, so we'll begin by looking at one of the most notorious and infamous studies on STIs that was ever conducted in our country. Um, now, of course, this study would not be allowed legally because it was very unethical and immoral, uh, but it is referred to as the, the Tuskegee Syphilis Study, and it was um, started in 1932 when the United States Public Health Service wanted to study the long-term effects of syphilis. And so they began recruiting African-American men, um, and among those men, about 400 of them actually did have syphilis, and they were denied treatment. Um, in fact, the researchers didn't even tell them that they were infected, and they prevented them from getting treatment anywhere else. So many of the men actually passed their diseases to their partners, um, and got very sick. Some of them died, of course, when there was a treatment available for syphilis all along, but of course the study was interested in seeing what would happen to those people that were untreated. So in 1970, evidence of the study came to light, and in 1997, President Clinton apologized to the victims and their families and offered them compensation. So let's watch a video now on this uh, very famous uh, Tuskegee syphilis study. In 1932, the United States Public Health Service launched the most shameful 
hideous and longest non-therapeutic experiment on human beings in medical history. The practitioners of the infamous Tuskegee syphilis experiment promised free medical care to over 400 African American and desperately poor sharecroppers in Macon County, Alabama. This wicked study was designed to document the progression of syphilis in black men. White scientists had long claimed that the disease manifested itself differently in blacks than in whites. Scientists decided to document this by finding a pool of infected black men, withholding treatment from them, and then charting the progression of symptoms and disorders as these men suffered in pain, eventually falling into insanity and dying. Now ain't that a bitch. The sad part is, a handful of African American healthcare providers actually worked with these sadists in order to mislead the test subjects for their continued compliance, as documented in this 1997 film, Miss Evers Boys, starring Alfre Woodard and Lawrence Fishburne. Going! No, 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 no,
we have an opportunity for a new beginning. Well, it's been 39 years since the Tuskegee syphilis experiment ended. In that time, the United States has seen many positive social changes and even elected its first black president. Yet the effects of the Tuskegee experiment can still be felt today through a deep mistrust of the medical industry by many African Americans. Some wonder if these emotional wounds will ever heal, and we can only hope and pray that they will. In the interim, we can only embrace the ideology of our Jewish brethren and vow never again. Okay, so uh, we're going to start our discussion of STIs with herpes simplex virus. And there's many different strains of herpes, um, but we're going to focus on type 1 and type 2. So um, type 2 is when a person gets sores on their genitals, and type 1 is when a person gets them on their mouth. So we'll begin by talking about um, genital herpes, or type 2. And so um, it's characterized by painful sores and blisters, usually in the genital um, and or anal area and it is a virus that can actually be found anywhere on the bot body but it's usually found in the genital area and it's passed by direct contact with infectious blisters or sores that are not dormant so that means they're exposed um, they're not in a latency stage but they're visible so in terms of the incubation period um, it can be anywhere from four to six weeks so some of the signs include itching, burning, or pain. Um, the pain can be an indication that an outbreak is about to occur. And then um, you can get, if you have herpes, um, painful blisters or sores on the genitals or rectum, which would be type 2, or sores on your mouth, which would be type 1. And the sores um, tend to break, and then they crust over, and they typically heal in 2 to 4 weeks. Females with type 2 uh, herpes may have sores on the cervix, um, but that tends to get less frequent with time. And factors like stress, fatigue, and other illnesses can trigger recurrence of sores in some people. Um, there's also asymptomatic shedding which can occur, and this is the release of infectious uh, virus particles even when no symptoms of the infection are present. So generally, the idea is if you can see the outbreak, then you definitely want to avoid sex, and this is where it's highly contagious, or any kind of contact with the herpes, um, that's when it's highly contagious. However, it is possible for asymptomatic shedding to happen, um, which is even though you can't see the um, the herpes, you can't see a sore or a blister, it is still possible to pass the infection onto someone else. In terms of diagnosis, um, generally you would just go to your um, physician and they would do a visual examination, um, a pap smear, and then there's also um, the ability to look at fluid from the sore on a microscopic slide or by looking at the tissue. Um, currently there's not a medicine that can cure herpes. Um, however, there are medications available to relieve pain or to shorten the time of um, the, the amount of time that a person has a sore or to prevent bacterial infections um, from open sores. And then there are a class of medications called antiherpetics that are actually developed to treat outbreaks of the herpes virus. So not cure it, but reduce or prevent the number of blisters and sores that a person is getting. Um, some of the dangers of herpes are um, going to occur mostly for women and pregnant women, but overall herpes isn't an incredibly dangerous um, STI, especially compared to the other ones. However, women may have a greater risk of developing cancer of the cervix, and if a woman is pregnant um, during delivery, it's possible for her to um, pass the disease on to the infant, especially if she's having an outbreak. Um, and in, it is possible for an infant that um, contracts the disease to die from contracting it, um, especially if they have a low immune system. Or in other cases, there have been some infants who have contracted uh, herpes and had brain damage because of it. However, generally pregnant women are tested for um, genital herpes 
prior to going into labor and then if they have genital herpes they usually are just given a c-section to avoid the chance of the infant um, contracting the disease at all. And then um, in terms of type 1 and type 2 it is possible for um, type 1 to cause type 2 and vice versa so they are kind of interchangeable. In terms of the incidence, 7 million people are affected by new or recurrent episodes annually and as far as the prevalence of genital herpes it's estimated to be about 16 percent of the US population or one in six people. But this number could be way off because a lot of people don't know that they have herpes. So let's go ahead and watch a, a couple video clips now on um, herpes simplex virus. I have herpes and I bet you do too. Turns out almost everyone does. Hey guys, Julia here for DNews. Yeah, it's true, I'm just one of millions and millions of people who have herpes type 1. And I've had cold sores on my lips plenty of times in my life. They're painful, gross, and unfortunately, incurable. It's caused by a virus and spread by contact. And it's a very common virus. Nearly two-thirds of everyone on this planet has had one of two strains that usually causes painful and irritating sores on their lips and genitals. And some estimates say as many as 90% of adults have some strain of herpes. While there are eight different strains of the virus, most people are familiar and infected with type 1 and type 2. There are other types of herpes as well, types that cause chickenpox, mono, or other less well-known diseases. Human herpes simplex virus is ancient. According to a study published in the journal Molecular Biology and Evolution, the HSV1 strain is over 6 million years old. The other strain is significantly younger. HSV2 was contracted in humans from chimpanzees over 1.6 million years ago, which means means the virus has been a part of our lives before we were even human. And it's a strong sucker. A study published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society found that the DNA in a virus like this is so tightly packed and under pressure. This high pressure allows it to be powerfully injected into a host cell. It then turns the cell into a virus-making factory, turning out more copies of itself. Since the virus never goes away, herpes is in constant battle with your immune system. Most of the time, your immune system is winning and the virus is latent and dormant in your nerve cells. Well, maybe not entirely dormant, according to research from the Australian National University. Researchers found that the virus is actually pretty active most of the time, but our immune cells are constantly pushing it down. And since HSV is an old virus, it's evolved some tricks of its own. HSV-1 actually rearranges our telomeres, according to a study published in the journal Cell Reports. Telomeres are the caps on our DNA, often compared to the plastic tips on your shoelaces. They serve pretty much the same function. They keep the strands of DNA from fraying. The virus attacks telomeres in a few ways, but basically it degrades a telomere protein called TPP1. When this protein is inhibited, the virus is better able to replicate itself. And this is the good news, bad news part of the story. In bad news, you can still spread the virus even if you're not showing symptoms. One study published in JAMA found that 20% of people with symptoms were shedding the virus, and even 10% of those without symptoms shed the virus as well. But there might be a good side to herpes. One study published in the journal Nature found it offered protection from serious diseases, at least in mice. Basically, the virus makes your immune system make more of a protein hormone called interferon gamma. This sets your system on high alert, so your immune system is ready to attack other invaders. In this case, it protects against bacterial infections like the plague and food poisoning. But just in case you're ready to give up on the benefits and the sores, there might be some hope. There's a lot of research on the herpes virus and a lot of potential for cures or treatments. The more common types of drugs like acyclovir tend to focus on the stage when the virus is multiplying in the skin rather than in nerve cells. And that's a tricky place since the virus can often build resistance to treatment at that stage, but scientists are working on that. Like in one study published in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, researchers found that the herpes virus goes through a kind of bottleneck in the body as it moves from its dormant state in nerve cells into skin cells. Only a few cells make the hair wing journey, and once they're in the skin cells, usually on the lip, that's where they multiply. So scientists are looking to target this transitional period since the virus might be more susceptible to drug treatments. So scientists keep working on drugs that work at earlier stages, like one drug tested in a study published in the journal Science Translational Medicine. They used an epigenetic approach. The drug they studied exists already, and they found it blocked a protein called LSD1, which works in early stages of the virus and can turn genes on and off. By blocking the protein, the drug kept the virus latent. 
So yeah, that's herpes. You probably have it. You can still spread it when you're not showing symptoms. There's no cure, but there are some decent treatment options. While viral STIs can't be cured, they can be prevented with proper sex education, practicing safe sex, and some can be prevented by vaccines like HPV. Want to know more about the HPV vaccine? Check out this video right here. The researchers say that even though currently a smaller percentage of women are vaccinated than what's ideal, it might be cheaper to increase the percentage of boys vaccinated than work on increasing coverage in the ladies. All right, guys, curious about other STIs? Ask your questions down below and we might just answer in a future video. Don't forget to hit those like and subscribe buttons so you don't miss a single D News episode. Herpes, it's way creepier than you ever thought. I'm Anna Rothschild, and this is Gross Science. <laughs> Herpes viruses are super common and quite diverse. If you've ever had cold sores, chicken pox, or mono, you've had a herpes virus. In fact, we know of eight different types of herpes viruses that infect humans. And if you've had one, that infection lasts a lifetime. That's because herpes viruses go into what's called a latent phase, which is like a state of hibernation where the virus hides in your cells. And what I find so interesting is just where these viruses are hiding. Believe it or not, the ones that cause cold sores, genital sores, and chicken pox actually hide in neurons around your body. And this can have some pretty weird implications. For example, if you had chicken pox as a kid, the virus might flare up later in life as the disease shingles. Shingles causes a painful rash, which appears in particular locations on your skin, depending on which nerve the virus was hiding in. A friend of mine once got shingles on his left butt cheek because the virus flared up in the nerve connected to that patch of skin. It was apparently very uncomfortable. Anyway, because herpes hides in your nervous system, it can sometimes make its way to your brain, though this only happens in about two in a million people. On these very rare occasions, the same virus that causes cold sores can sneak into your temporal lobes and cause a host of unpleasant effects including death. But some people who survive are left with a very strange type of brain damage. They're totally normal, except they've lost the ability to recognize whole classes of things, like animals or colors or tools. One survivor could no longer identify whether a drawing depicted a real animal or a fictional hybrid beast. And while I wouldn't wish brain herpes on anyone, because of its specificity, this type of brain damage has actually revealed some secrets about how our brains store and categorize information. Anyway, scientists are learning more about these viruses all the time. In the past few years, they've begun to understand how to lure herpes out of the nervous system. And hopefully one day, we'll be able to stop all eight types of herpes in their tracks. Ew. By the way, my friend Vanessa has been looking into another famous case of brain damage leading to scientific discovery. Vanessa? Come over to Braincraft to hear the story of a man who had a one meter iron rod blasted through his skull. Think bits of brain and skull everywhere. He survived, but his personality didn't. Got a question about herpes? Let me know in the comments. And to learn more about brain trauma and neuroscience, check out Braincraft and Sam Keen's book, The Tale of the Dueling Neurosurgeons. Oh, and if you don't already, subscribe to Gross Science. Okay, so the next STI we're going to discuss is the human papillomavirus, um, and this is also known as genital warts. It's a sexually transmitted virus that is typically characterized by warts in the genital or anal area, and that may lead to some forms of cancer. So it's transmitted by direct contact um, from the genital and anal areas. And the incubation period is anywhere from six weeks to eight months, but the average, uh, what's true for most people, is four to 12 weeks. Um, in terms of typical symptoms, um, some people might not have any symptoms, and others can have um, growths in the genital and anal area that look like warts. So usually they are diagnosed by observation of the growths or a biopsy. In terms of the treatment, um, 
there is medication that's available to apply to the growth. Or in other cases, some people will get the uh, warts frozen or uh, have laser therapy done or even surgical removal. Um, some of the dangers of HPV is that the warts can grow to a large size and then obstruct like the vagina, the urethra, the anus. Um, it is possible for HPV to be transmitted to an infant during birth and there is evidence that HPV can lead to cervical cancer. Um, it's very, very common. 50% of sexually active people will have this in their lifetime and that's probably a low estimate. In terms of the incidence of HPV, six million new uh, there are 6 million new incidents in the U.S. each year. And in terms of the prevalence, um, so all new and existing cases, there are 20 million people in the U.S. population that have HPV. So it is the most common STI in the U.S. as of uh, today, as of now. So let's go ahead and watch a video clip on HPV. What is the most common STI? Let's pretend that the title of this video didn't give it away. The vast majority of us will contract at least one strain of HPV. That includes you, and that includes me. Warts are very common, and we're all familiar with warts, right? We've seen them, maybe you've had some. They can appear on your toes or your fingers. They can also appear on your genitals. I have at least one strain of HPV. You can see on my hand, I have this little scar from when I got a wart removed last year. Warts are caused by HPV, and there are over 150 strains of it. 40 of those strains are transmitted through sex. We can break down those 40 strains into two basic categories. There are higher risk strains and low risk strains. Low risk strains are the types that can cause warts. They're low risk strains because even though they cause warts and people see that as a big scary thing they don't cause cancer so you know it's not a risk to your health there are two strains that cause most cases of genital warts high risk strains are labeled high risk because they're the types that can cause cancer there are 13 different strains that can cause cancer including 16 and 18 that's what we found for white patients anyway a study by duke found that black women actually are more likely to have types 35 66 and 68 so this is a really important note we're going to come back to this HPV lives in epithelial cells. You can think of these as like surface cells. They're on your skin and moist surfaces. And it's transmitted through skin to skin contact, just like herpes. The fact that it's so easy to spread around is part of why a lot of people get it. Most people don't know they have it. There aren't really any symptoms unless it becomes cancerous. So it just sort of flies around all over the place. Another reason that it's really common is because there is no FDA approved HPV test for males or anyone with a penis. Yup, you heard that right. There's no way to test men for HPV. That's kind of bad because HPV is responsible for virtually all cervical cancers. Less commonly, but it still happens, HPV can cause penile, anal, and oral cancers. Fortunately, getting cancer from HPV is relatively rare. About 90% of cases just clear up on their own within a couple years. And more good news, pap smears will prevent HPV from causing cancer. <laughs> Let me just say a thing about pap smears. It's like the worst name for a cancer screening ever. I know that pap smears can be uncomfortable for people because you have to get naked, the doctor, you know, swab your cervix to look at the cells. That could be a little bit vulnerable. It's like, hey, the doctor is just literally in my vulva <laughs> right now. If your first few pap smears feel a little bit awkward or uncomfortable, you're completely normal. It's okay. Just know that this is for your health. Now, in the event that your pap smear does come back abnormal, don't forget. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily cancer or anything bad. There are a lot of reasons that a result can be abnormal, and it provides your doctor with the information they need if they need to monitor your cervical cells so that they can catch anything before it becomes cancerous. Vagina owners, this is why pap smears are really important. The CDC recommends that you start getting them when you're 21, and then every three years after that. Side note, there are also anal pap smears, but they're much less common. They're usually only used in populations where someone's considered high risk. And guess what? There's even more good news. Condoms can help lower your risk and vaccines can prevent HPV entirely. This is really fucking cool. Gardasil 9 is a three shot series and it protects against the types of HPV that are most likely to cause problems. But point to note, Gardasil 9 isn't quite as effective for black women as it is for white women. Why is that? During clinical trials, only 57 out of 2300 of the studies actually looked at populations of people from African descent. So scientists basically have developed a vaccine that's based on data from white people. It wasn't intentional, it wasn't malicious, but it's significant. We need to be paying attention to representation in medical 
medical studies. I really hope that the next update of Gardasil includes more of the strains that will protect people equally. When should you get the vaccine? Kids should be getting it around age 11 before they have any potential exposure to the virus, and you can get it up to age 26. The more of us that are protected, the less it will spread, so get vaccinated. Get vaccinated. Internet, did you hear that? During the first shot, my son got lightheaded and that made me worry. I read online that vaccines can cause autism or other bad side effects. I just don't trust scientists with these things. I read this article that said there's aluminum in vaccines, like actual metal. There are websites online that are spreading paranoia and fear about vaccines. Those types of things make us feel scared, right? Because we all want to feel safe and protected and parents want to protect their children. But the fact is vaccines do protect us and they do protect kids. Vaccines have saved millions of lives. As someone who would like to see a healthier, happier world, please get vaccinated. If you're feeling a little anxious about vaccines, I think that, you know, information from reliable resources is a really good way to calm those fears. So I'm going to link some more reading down below. Okay, there you have it. There is the HPV 101. There are also overlaps in this conversation about stigma from STIs that I already covered in my herpes video, which you can check out here. But other than that, please stay safe and healthy out there. Sending lots of love. Mwah. I'll see y'all next time. Except your mom. Oh. What? Okay, so we are going to discuss the hepatitis B virus now. And it's a virus that may be sexually transmitted and may lead to inflammation and impaired functioning of the liver. It's actually a virus that's found in saliva, blood, semen, urine, and feces, and it's passed by sexual contact, including anal or oral sex. It can be passed non-sexually as well from needles or other similar objects. Um, the incubation period is usually 15 to 50 days, but it can be anywhere from one to six months. So some people don't have any symptoms of hepatitis B, but others that do have nausea, fever, loss of appetite, dark cola-colored urine, abdominal discomfort, or even jaundice. So jaundice is a symptom of hepatitis that's characterized by a deep yellowing of the skin and eyes, um, and also an enlarged liver. So the way that a person would get diagnosed with hepatitis B is through a blood test. And currently, in terms of treatment, there really is no medical cure. Um, most people do recover within six to eight weeks with just bed rest, good nutrition, avoiding alcohol, and drugs is, is recommended so that your immune system stays high. Um, there are vaccines available for hepatitis B. However, it is possible for uh, this disease to cause severe illness, liver damage, cirrhosis of the liver, um, liver cancer, death, premature birth, or spontaneous abortion if an infant were to acquire it from the mother. Um, and so in terms of incidence, there's about 45,000 new cases per year. And um, in terms of prevalence, about 5% of the U.S. population has um, hepatitis B. So we're going to watch now a video clip um, that is a story of a woman that is living with hepatitis B and her experience of it and her daily struggles and things like that. Since the day she was born, Arlene Lowe has carried a dangerous virus known as hepatitis B. She learned she was a carrier in her late 30s, but kept the diagnosis a secret for 15 years. I was devastated. All I can think of is I have three young children, and I have a husband, I have a good career, and what is going to happen to my kids and husband uh, while I'm sick in bed. Hepatitis B is a viral infection and it infects the liver, and over time, it can cause damage to the liver so that it doesn't work properly. And in a certain group of patients, it can even cause liver cancer. Chronic hepatitis B affects fewer than one in 200 Americans. But among Asians, that figure is an astounding one in 10. The virus typically spreads through blood, intercourse, or from mother to baby during childbirth. The latter route. Uh, from infected mother to a newborn baby is actually the most common way by which hepatitis B is transmitted among Asians. 
In most countries, newborns are now vaccinated against hepatitis B, a step that prevents transmission from the mother. But the virus continues to strike adults who never received the vaccine. The infection is very easy to diagnose. It's a simple blood test that tells you whether a patient has chronic hepatitis B infection. And if you do test positive, go and request to get further testing so that you know if you may be one of those uh, who should be started on treatment now. I'm just going to go look at your film and I'll tell you the result, okay? Not everyone right. with hepatitis B needs treatment, but all patients should be tested regularly for viral activity and signs of cirrhosis, a dangerous scarring of the liver. Doctors say the most serious complications can often be prevented thanks to powerful new therapies that suppress the virus when it's active. When a virus is suppressed to lower level, there's less liver injury. And we do have data to show that uh, over time, the patients who have a sustained suppression of virus do have a reduced chance of developing cirrhosis, liver failure, and liver cancer. There are several FDA-approved treatments for hepatitis B. These include injectable therapies and oral medications, one of which has had dramatic results for Arlene. I don't have any hepi virus at all at this, at this time, uh, and I didn't have any flare-up for the last five years. In terms of the treatment, I think I found my magic bullet. The oral medications are one pill a day, very few side effects, but they're very effective at suppressing the virus. Um, I really Unfortunately, feel only a fraction of those who could benefit here. receive treatment. No here, I think part of the problem in the Asian community is that hepatitis B is looked upon as a taboo. If you have it, um, uh, no one likes to talk about it. Advocates like Arlene are working to change that. I would encourage anybody who's diagnosed with chronic Hep B to seek treatment as early as possible. The chance to spread this message is what prompted Arlene to start speaking up after so many years of silence. Okay, so for lecture activity one, I'd like you to think on um, back on the last three STIs we discussed, so herpes, HPV, and hepatitis B, and then um, tell me which one would be the most concerning to you if you found out you had a diagnosis of it and why. So uh, for me, I'd be most concerned about HPV um, because I would be uh, worried about cervical cancer. So that's all I'm looking for in terms of an answer. Uh, so just give me one to two sentences on which one of those you'd be the most concerned with if you got a diagnosis of it and why for lecture activity one. And this is chapter eight. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about HIV and AIDS. So HIV stands for the human immunodeficiency virus and this is the virus that causes AIDS. And AIDS is a gradual failure of the immune system that leads to serious opportunistic infections, which in turn may lead to death. So opportunistic infections are infections that prey on a low immune system, um, like pneumonia, for example. Um, and so uh, this is a, a retrovirus, a type of virus such as HIV that survives and multiplies by invading and destroying the DNA of normal body cells and then replicates its own DNA into the host cell's chromosomes. And it can be transmitted through sexual contact, uh, contaminated needles, and transfusions. Um, the AIDS virus actually attacks the body's immune system, which is uh, its natural defense against disease. So if your immune system isn't working, then you're more um, open to those opportunistic infections, and then your body can't fight them off, um, which is one of the ways that AIDS can lead to death. So in terms of the incubation period, it may be from six months to um, several years, but the initial symptoms may appear within a few days and then resolve in a week. So some of the typical symptoms are fever, rash, weight loss, severe tiredness, swollen glands, and diarrhea. All these symptoms tend to last a long time and then gradually get worse. Um, because the immune system does not work well, people can get severe pneumonia or unusual cancers, which for people with uh, HIV and AIDS is especially common in the skin. 
So in terms of diagnosis, a new laboratory test is currently available, um, but diagnosis is still somewhat complicated and requires a medical exam. So even if you take like an at-home HIV test, it would be important to also go to your doctor um, at the conclusion of that test and just make sure the results are accurate. Um, once you go to the doctor, you have options of confidential testing or anonymous testing. So with confidential testing, um, names are kept on file in the lab's records, but with assurance of full confidentiality. And with anonymous testing, um, the test is administered without collecting any personal information about the clients who are identified only by an assigned code number. And so... Um, Treatment for HIV and AIDS is progressing really, really quickly. Um, but for a while now, many people that are HIV positive will take what are known as highly active antiretroviral therapy drugs, which is a combination of several medications that are prescribed for people who are HIV positive, and the intention of them is to delay the onset of AIDS. So... Um, there are treatments for some complications, but currently there is no definite cure, although recent research shows that we are definitely getting close, um, and it's possible that we have found the antibodies that will um, fight and protect against HIV and AIDS. Um, so until we know for sure if those medications work, um, uh, up until then, there has really been no way to get the immune system going again once the virus has damaged it. But like I said, maybe these uh, new drugs that are coming out um, will fix that. So in terms of the danger of HIV and AIDS, uh, nearly half of all patients have died. Um, and the main reason for this is that it leads to opportunistic infections, like we said before. And just to give you a definition of opportunistic infections, they're diseases that establish themselves in the human body only when the immune system is weakened and incapable of fighting them off. So um, people receiving the highly active antiretroviral therapy uh, live about 35 years after the infection on average. However, if um, HIV goes untreated, then the average time from infection to death is 8 to 12 years. So currently, the incidence of HIV are 40,000 people per year, and the prevalence is that 1.1 million people are infected uh, with HIV AIDS in the U.S. population. So let's watch a video now on the science of HIV and AIDS, and uh, then we'll take a look at what the most uh, recent findings are on a possible cure for HIV. Um, it's important to note that this is being recorded in 2017, so it's possible that there, uh, if you're listening to this after 2017, then it's possible that there um, are new cures available and things like that. So you'll want to look that up on your own um, if the information seems outdated. HIV AIDS has taken the lives of over 39 million people worldwide, despite our efforts to prevent, treat, and better understand it. But with 35 million people currently infected, what exactly is it, and are we close to a cure? To contract HIV, the virus must enter the bloodstream, and it's often transmitted from infected bodily fluids like blood, semen, vaginal fluids, or breast milk. Once inside the bloodstream, HIV targets a variety of cells, but most specifically the T helper cells, which are a type of white blood cell that play an essential role in our immune system and fighting infections. The outer envelope of HIV is covered in glycoproteins, which mutate frequently, ultimately tricking the T cell receptors to not recognize the virus. Once attached to specific proteins on the T cell, it begins to fuse the membranes together and eventually enters the cell where it releases two viral RNA strands and three essential replications enzymes. Because HIV is a retrovirus, the RNA is transcribed into DNA, represented here by a zipper of two RNA strands transcribing into DNA. This DNA is then integrated into the host cell's genome. This makes the T cells treat the viral genes like their own, which causes them to make more copies of the virus. These then leave the host cell immature, ultimately seeking more T cells. The virus is particularly difficult to treat because its mutation rate is so high. 
Overall, the replication process creates more than 10 billion new virions each day. During these initial stages of replication, called the latency period, a person may not show any major symptoms for up to 8 years. If not treated, the HIV eventually kills off the specific T-cells it infects. When these T-cells fall below 200 cells per cubic millimeter of blood, it becomes Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS. After progressing this far, the immune system becomes suppressed and is much more susceptible to cancers and opportunistic infections such as pneumonia. A person doesn't die from AIDS, they actually die from an illness that the body could not fend off. Nowadays, there is medicine that helps fight these opportunistic infections, like Daraprim, which was recently in the news when Martin Screlly of Turing Pharmaceutical decided to raise raised the price from $13.50 to $750 per pill. There are also antiretroviral drugs that slow the virus down by blocking certain enzymes which are required for the virus to multiply. Similarly, those without HIV but at high risk of contracting the virus may take pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. This works similar to antiretroviral drugs by blocking the enzyme reverse transcriptase. Thankfully, there is hope for a cure. A small population of people are immune to the HIV virus because of a mutation linked to the T cells. In one case, an HIV positive subject received a bone marrow transplant, meaning they were given new stem cells that generate different T cells, and within 20 months, there was no evidence of the virus in their bloodstream. Though this is very individualized medicine, it certainly opens up the possibilities of generating HIV-resistant cells. Combine this with other therapies and preventative measures like condoms, clean needle programs, and safe blood transfusions, and HIV-AIDS may one day be a thing of the past. Your sharing of this video is much appreciated in the effort to help spread knowledge and awareness. And a special thanks to Audible for supporting this episode to give you a free 30-day trial at audible.com ASAP. This week, we wanted to recommend the book Redefining Reality, which explores what is real and what is illusory from both a scientific and philosophical perspective through a series of really awesome lectures. You can get a free 30-day trial at audible.com ASAP and choose from a massive selection. We love them as they're great when you're on the go. And subscribe for more weekly science videos. When I found out I was HIV positive, I wasn't upset. I was terrified. Saying I have HIV is something big. It changes your life. Taking arterial treatments is, is not a desired option. They have all their side effects on, on our body functions. They are very expensive. That is especially limiting in resource-poor settings, of course. Take, for instance, Lesotho, where $25 are assigned per person per year for health care. You can imagine that adequate care for HIV infection is just absolutely impossible. But there may now be an alternative. Medical researchers have developed a therapeutic vaccine that could defeat HIV. Unlike conventional vaccines which prevent disease, a therapeutic vaccine helps equip infected bodies to defeat a disease that's already being contracted. Around 1% of the population have innate immunity to HIV. Their bodies can fight the disease without the need for drugs. We wanted to help people to become this normally only 1% that can deal with the infection without taking drugs. And so what we wanted to achieve is really what we call a functional cure. A functional cure is where the patient doesn't suffer any of the problems associated with HIV, but there may still be traces of the virus in his or her system. HIV infects some of a person's white blood cells that normally help protect the body against illness. Once the immune system is compromised, an infected person is at risk of dying from such diseases as tuberculosis, pneumonia or the flu. HIV is so hard to treat because it is usually hidden from the body's own defence system in otherwise healthy-looking cells. To kill it requires a two-step process. Firstly, the vaccine boosts a patient's immune system so it is better able to fight the virus. Then the patient is given a drug called Romidepsin, 
which causes the HIV-infected white blood cells to release proteins on their surfaces, identifying them to the body. The patient's white blood cells, boosted by the vaccine, are thus able to find and destroy these HIV-infected cells. A group of scientists ran trials of the vaccine on 13 people who had recently contracted HIV with the aim of helping their immune systems find HIV-infected cells and destroy them. Once the patients received the vaccine, they stopped taking their antiretroviral treatment and began taking romidepsin to see whether their immune systems could defeat the disease. And the results were encouraging. Five out of the 13 individuals can control the virus. For this 40% of the trial's participants, it's been life-changing, including patient A05. When I was first told that the treatment had worked and it was undetectable, it was brilliant. Since I have had the vaccine, I haven't had to take any pills or any meds for six months. It's not a complete cure, so everything is fine. I'm thrilled. I don't know what side effects I might have from taking this treatment. I'm thrilled, but I'm always expecting the worst. Over the next years, we will see certainly a number of, of trials of therapeutic vaccination going on here and in many other places in the world. We need to hope that we can induce a functional cure in a large proportion of these individuals and take them off on trial treatment. But this does not mean we have won against HIV and we have eradicated that virus from the face of the earth. These people are still infected. The challenge is to really achieve eradication of the virus and only then can we start thinking of getting rid of HIV and making it a history. Okay, so uh, chlamydia is a sexually transmitted bacteria, often causing a thick, cloudy discharge from the penis or the vagina, and it may be asymptomatic, especially in women. So it's typically passed by direct contact between the infectious mucous membranes, in other words, genitals, anus, or mouth, of one per of one person to another. Um, contaminated fingers can pass the organism from infected membranes into the eyes. Um, but catching the disease from objects is actually very unlikely. So the incubation period is uh, usually for most people on between 2 to 10 days, but it can be as short as one day or um, as long as 30 days or more. So as I mentioned, the genitals, anus, throat, and eyes can be infected. Um, some typical symptoms for males are burning uh, urination and pus discharge, um, infection of the urethra, but about 50% of, of men have no symptoms. And then females may have vaginal discharge, although up to 75% of females have no symptoms. Um, and so their diagnosis is usually um, an, a microscopic observation of the discharge or a culture from the possible infection site or even a urine test can um, discover chlamydia. It is completely treatable with antibiotics and curable. However, if it goes untreated, it can cause sterility in both sexes, arthritis, blindness, meningitis, heart disease, kidney damage, skin rash, um, ectopic pregnancies, and eye damage in newborns. Um, one of the things it can also cause is pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a painful condition marked by inflammation of the uterus, fallopian tubes, and ovaries. Um, it can also cause urethritis, which is a painful inflammation of the urethra, and it can cause epididymitis, which is the painful swelling and inflammation of the epididymis, uh, which is the structure at the back of each testicle that stores the maturing sperm. It is the number one most reported communicable disease 
Um, and the pelvic inflammatory disease, which is a symptom of it, occurs in about 15% of females that are infected with chlamydia. In terms of the incidence, about 1.2 million um, new cases of chlamydia are reported annually in the United States. So let's go ahead and watch a video now on chlamydia. Hi everybody, this is Kaylee, and today we're going to be talking about one of the worst possible downfalls of having unprotected sex, sexually transmitted disease, chlamydia. Chlamydia is a sexually transmitted disease caused by the bacterium strain called Chlamydia trichomis. And unfortunately, this particular STD, when left untreated, can lead to serious, long, and short-term negative effects on reproductive health. So today, we're going to find out A, how common is chlamydia and what are its symptoms? B, well, if you are infected, then what? What kind of treatment is available? And lastly, if left untreated, what kind of complications can arise from being infected with chlamydia? As with any sexually transmitted disease, if you are sexually active, you're at risk for contracting chlamydia. According to the CDC, however, chlamydia is the most highly reported STD in the country right now. Actually, according to a recent survey, there are over 2.2 million U.S. citizens between ages 14 and 39 that are currently infected, most of whom don't even know this. That's because 50% of women and 75% of men who have chlamydia don't have any symptoms whatsoever and are unaware that they're infected. Now for those who do have symptoms, usually appearing one to three weeks after infection, this is the not so fun part because they can include any of the following. Discharge from the genitals or pain while urinating, general bleeding and pain, and for some women, fever, nausea, and pain during sex. Chlamydia itself can be contracted through oral, anal, or vaginal sex and can manifest itself in the vagina, penis, throat, and anus. No bueno. <laughs> So, if you are infected, well, then what? What kind of treatment is available? Being a bacterial disease as opposed to a viral disease, chlamydia is fairly easy to cure and treat once diagnosed. The CDC suggests that all women under 25 should go for regular yearly testing, all women over 25 with new sex partners should be tested, and all pregnant women should be tested for chlamydia in an effort to diagnose, treat, and prevent adverse effects from arising. So, once diagnosed, chlamydia can be treated with a single dosage of the antibiotic called doxycycline, and this usually lasts about a week. And during this time, most doctors suggest that all infected persons and their partners abstain from all forms of sexual activity. So, if left untreated, what kind of adverse complications can arise from exposure to chlamydia? Generally, treatment is fairly easy, and chlamydia can be cured. However, Due to the fact that most men and women with chlamydia are completely unaware that they are infected, many adverse effects and complications can arise before knowledge of the infection is even, you know, there. And generally, for women, these effects are more serious. Men rarely, if ever, have complications from exposure to chlamydia. However, in some rare instances, the infection can spread to the epididymis, which is the tube from the testes that carries sperm, causing general pain and, in some rare cases, sterility among men. For women, however, a range of complications can occur since chlamydia can spread from the cervix to the uterus or fallopian tubes. In 40% of untreated cases among women, these patients contract PID, or pelvic inflammatory disease. PID can lead to permanent damage of the reproductive organs, which in turn causes things like chronic pain, infertility, or pregnancy outside of the uterus, called ectopic pregnancy, which can be fatal. Also, in pregnant women with chlamydia, the disease can be passed from mother to child during a vaginal birth. Now, for a newborn baby, this can cause a myriad of complications, including things like pneumonia and pink eye. In very rare instances, arthritis, skin lesions, swelling of the eyes, or urethra can also be caused from exposure to chlamydia. For all you gentlemen out there, I want you to stay with me for a second and imagine you're Johnson and this book. Now, that wouldn't be too comfortable. Join me for a future video where we're gonna discuss the clap, more commonly known as gonorrhea. <clears throat> Did you know that 75% of Americans carry the herpes virus? 
Join me in a future video where we'll discuss this and more facts about herpes. Well, folks, if that's not enough incentive to wrap it before you tap it, use a condom. Then I don't know what is. This is Kaylee. Thanks for joining me on our discussion about chlamydia. Please rate my video, leave me any comments that you'd like, and don't forget to subscribe. See you later. One to three weeks after the infected, after being infected, <laughs> damn it, after the infected, zombie craze. <laughs> Stop. Yeah, I'm breaking. <clears throat> Discharge from the general genitals or pain while urinating. Damn it, <laughs> generals. Okay, so gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted bacteria that typically produces pain during urination, a thick, cloudy discharge from the penis or vagina, um, but it is often asymptomatic, especially in women. So it's passed during sexual contact. Infants can become infected during vaginal delivery. It is highly contagious. Um, some of the nicknames for gonorrhea are clap, drip, and burn. The incubation period is two to five days on average for males. Um, but up to 14 days. And usually there are no symptoms, like I said, in females. Um, however, when there are symptoms um, or symptoms for males, they tend to develop slowly and are often mild. Um, females sometimes see a slight vaginal discharge, itching and burning of the vagina, painful intercourse, abdominal pain, or fever, especially if it's left untreated for a while. For males, um, it's common for them to see discharge from the penis, burning and itching at the urethral opening, or a burning sensation during urination. Um, in terms of diagnosing gonorrhea, a culture test of fluid from the infected area or urine test uh, will usually be able to determine if a person has contracted the disease um, and the results are, are usually um, given back to the patient within only 20 minutes. So it's curable with antibiotics, not penicillin, um, but there are a lot of other antibiotics that are capable of curing it. Uh, the danger is that if it's untreated, it can cause sterility, premature and still births, um, infant pneumonia and eye infections, which can lead to blindness. Um, so it can also cause epididymitis in the men and pelvic inflammatory disease in women. In terms of the incidence, there are about 300,000 new cases of gonorrhea each year in the United States. And in terms of the prevalence, there are currently about 1.2 million people infected in the U.S. population. Okay, so let's watch a video now on gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is a bacterial infection and therefore it is completely curable. One of the biggest myths around gonorrhea is that you would know if you had it. But gonorrhea is often asymptomatic, which means it has no symptoms. So you might not know that you have it. Gonorrhea tends to be more symptomatic actually in women than in men. So women might know they have it because they might have a discharge or a burning upon urination. Men, when they have symptoms, will also have the same type of symptoms, a discharge or burning upon urination. And the only way to know that you have it is to get tested. It is completely curable with antibiotics. A really important fact about gonorrhea is in order to get rid of it, both partners need to be treated at the same time and they both need to take their full course of antibiotic in order to rid the body of the infection. If not, they can keep passing it back and forth or pass it to other partners. Another myth about gonorrhea is that it doesn't really exist anymore, and that's just not true. In certain populations, especially young people, it's very much on the rise again, and gonorrhea and chlamydia often are co-infections, so if someone has chlamydia, they will often be infected with gonorrhea as well. One very important thing to note is that although gonorrhea and chlamydia are completely curable with antibiotics, if left undiagnosed and untreated, they can lead to infertility in both men and women. So it's really important to follow medical provider information and follow the prescription that you're given if you are diagnosed with gonorrhea. 
Gonorrhea is becoming resistant to one of the only drugs left that can treat it. And the number of people contracting the disease is on the rise. 5% more people had gonorrhea in 2014 compared to the year before. A two-drug cocktail is usually the recommended regimen, but studies show one of the antibiotics is working less and less. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention released a report on Friday that showed gonorrhea is quickly growing resistant to azithromycin, one of the drugs prescribed to treat it. The CDC discovered the percentage of gonorrhea that doesn't respond to azithromycin grew from 0.6% in 2013 to 2.5% in 2014. Symptoms of gonorrhea include pain, bleeding, and burning. The problem is most people don't show signs until the late stages, if at all. And if left untreated, gonorrhea can cause infertility and sterility in women and men. Although numbers are still small and the disease is rarely life-threatening, the CDC recommends women under the age of 25 and gay men who are sexually active get tested once a year. For Newsy, I'm Catherine Beek. Okay, so for lecture activity two, I'd like for you to just tell me um, something that you learned about either HIV, AIDS, chlamydia, or gonorrhea. So something you didn't know prior to listening to the lecture and watching the video clips um, that you now know. Um, so if you could do that in one to two sentences, that would be great for lecture activity two. So syphilis is a sexually transmitted bacteria that's characterized by a sore, or what's often referred to as a canker, at the point of the infection. If it's left untreated, it may progress to a more serious a stage and even death. So um, it's passed by direct contact with infectious sores or rashes. The incubation period can be anywhere from 10 days to 3 months, but the average is 21 days. And there are different stages of syphilis. So in the um, primary stage, a person will have a painless canker, which is a sore that typically appears at the site of the infection with syphilis. Um, and in the primary stage, it's also common um, for infected people to experience swollen glands. And then the secondary stage is where symptoms usually um, appear within one to one week to six months um, after the appearance of the canker. And these symptoms may include rash, patchy hair loss, sore throat, and swollen glands. Um, the primary and secondary sores will go away even without treatment, but the germs continue to spread throughout the body. Um, and then there's the latent stage, which can continue for anywhere from 5 to 20 years where a person experiences no symptoms. It is possible for a pregnant woman in even the latent stage to transmit the disease to her unborn child. Um, and then there is the late stage, or what's sometimes called the tertiary stage. Um, and this stage varies from no symptoms to indications of damage to the body organs, such as the brain and heart. Generally, syphilis is diagnosed through a physical examination, um, microscope slides with fluid from the sore or tissues from the sore, or blood tests. Um, it's easily cured with antibiotics. Um, the danger if syphilis is left untreated is that there can be severe damage to the nervous system and other body organs, um, which usually happens after many years of having the disease and it going untreated. Um, so some of the um, things that can happen as a result of it being untreated are heart disease, insanity, brain damage, tumors of the skin, bones, livers, and severe illness um, or death of um, newborns in particular. So some of the symptoms might imitate those of other diseases. Um, and damage done to the body is permanent. So the treatment of pregnant women with syphilis is absolutely necessary to prevent damage to a fetus. Uh, the current incidence in the United States is about 45,000 people per year. So let's go ahead and watch a video now on syphilis. For many years, there were so few cases of syphilis, and it's one of those diseases that, for whatever reason, is on the rise again. There were almost 75,000 cases diagnosed last year in the U.S. And I'm glad you said diagnosis. It can be very, very tough to diagnose. We were talking about it in back. We learned in medical school they called syphilis the great imposter. I mean, it can present yes. in so many different ways. Every single organ system, uh, mm -hmm. obviously dermatology, but, but other organ systems well, 
sometimes can be a tough diagnosis, especially where you're not thinking of syphilis. Well, and here's, here's the concern. When penicillin was discovered, syphilis all but disappeared. Mm -hmm because people were vigilant for it back then. Penicillin was very effective. Now there are some more resistant strains we have to be very concerned about. But the other thing about syphilis, since people aren't looking for it, not thinking about it, we talk about all these other sexually transmitted infections, and nowadays people think, well, you know, HIV is no big deal because it can be treated. This isn't any big deal because it can be treated. But syphilis, the issue with it is, it progresses over time, and if it's not identified early and treated, it can create major problems. We have some picture because the first stage, it may just be a painless sore. You might confuse it for an ingrown hair, a cut, or maybe a harmless bump near your genitals or even in your mouth. Now, the second stage presents with a non-itchy body rash on the palms and hands or all over the body, maybe your feet. Here's the concern, the final stage of syphilis. You may have no symptoms at all, and you think you're fine, no treatment, but then all of a sudden, you can develop things like permanent blindness over time, brain damage, even death. When I was in residency, I spent a month working in the VA hospital right next to Vanderbilt Hospital, and I had a vet who had tertiary syphilis, and let me tell you, I learned a lot about how much you do not want to get this disease. So sad, and by that point, your typical treatments of, say, simple penicillin, the damage is, is largely they done. They don't cure I mean, the disease so much, from that point forward, well, so but the damage and the destruction that's been done can't be reversed. Well, so even though there is penicillin G, the problem is, number one, like you said, there are resistant strains now, which are very scary. Very number scary. two is there is a shortage of penicillin G right now in the United States, which is also, we think, contributing to the rise in these cases. And three, once you've destroyed the tissue, destroyed the nerves, then you can't undo okay. that. You can just keep it from going forward. And, and the so, nature of the way that disease progresses progresses the actual tissue reaction, mm -hmm. it's hard for the medication to, to penetrate, yes. Those tissues, the, it's, it's a walled type reaction. So for all those reasons, you know, there's so many other STDs that get more uh, time in the talk shows, mm -hmm. HPV and chlamydia and obviously herpes, but you know, we, we, that happens and we drop our guard against yeah, I, I think larger, we forget that uh, these diseases can come back. A, these diseases that we thought we sort of had at bay and were gonorrhea controlled. as well. Yeah, chlamydia. Is it me or uh, are a lot of people largely blasé about these sexually transmitted diseases? Because again, there may be this this thought process out there that you know none of these are that big of a deal. And again, a lot of it is because if you didn't grow up in the syphilis era and you're one of the 75,000 Americans who, who's recently caught this, you, you're completely naive to how serious it can be. And I, I want this to be a wake-up call for everyone and, and why it's so important to protect yourself, to, to, know, you know, to know your partner, to have that awkward conversation, as awkward as it is, to, in an ideal world, the two of you together, before you start a sexual relationship, talk about getting tested. Because the truth is, so many of these diseases you have no symptoms at all at first, and so you can pass it on to your partner. And women in particular are more susceptible. And, and also really important to point out that this can be passed from mother to baby during pregnancy as well. So this is one of those diseases, especially if you're not aware that you have it, that can infect your baby and cause a number of true congenital problems. And the other thing about syphilis is it's painless. So most people don't respond to even new lumps and bumps on their body, even in the genital area, as an example, unless it hurts. Sure. It's like, oh, okay, you, what do you do when you get a bump? You press it. That's the automatic reaction, even as a doctor. First thing, like, oh, it doesn't ah, hurt. Ah, I wonder what that is. You know, meanwhile, you're like, oh, I got that thing down there. And, you know, if you're out being sexually active, not only are you at risk, but then your partner's at risk. And with these now... Uh, again, the, these new strains that are more difficult to treat, resistant to antibiotics, I think it's just, it's a time to re-familiarize yourself with, with your partners and Get tested have and wear a condom. Okay, so we are going to talk now about trichomoniasis. And it is actually a protozoan, which uh, is usually passed by direct sexual contact. It can be transmitted through contact with wet objects, such as towels, washcloths, and douching equipment. Um, the nickname for uh, this disease is trick.
and the incubation period is anywhere from 4 to 20 days with the average being 7 days. So some of the typical symptoms um, for females is a white or greenish yellow odorous discharge, vaginal itching and soreness, painful urination, and for males it's slight itching of the penis, painful urination, um, or clear discharge from the penis. However, many women and most men have no symptoms. So the way that uh, trichomoniasis is diagnosed is um, by uh, getting a sample of the discharge and then looking at it under a uh, microscope. Um, it can also be diagnosed through a culture test or even just an examination. It is um, completely curable with oral medication. The long-term effects of it in adults is really not very well known or documented. There is some evidence that infected individuals are more likely to develop cervical cancers and that babies may become infected if a mother has this during a labor and delivery. And the incidence of trichomoniasis are that 7.4 million people are infected annually um, and in the uh, in the world and then the prevalence in the world is 170 million people are currently infected. So let's go ahead and watch a video now on trichomoniasis. Prostate cancer, STDs, and dogs, what do they all have in common? More than you might think. <laughs> Hey guys, Tara and Lacey here for D News with some new evidence that potentially links prostate cancer to certain STDs. Trichomoniasis is the most common non-viral sexually transmitted infection affecting nearly 275 million people worldwide, but most people don't even know they have it because it often doesn't have any symptoms, which is not good because a new study from the University of California shows that having trich can be bad news for men with prostate cancer. It's commonly known that certain types of cancer are caused by infections, but prostate cancer, the number one form of cancer for men has always been kind of a question mark. There are no known lifestyle factors that seem to affect one's risk of developing it, but we do know there's at least a genetic component since it tends to run in families. A study from 2009 found that a quarter of men with prostate cancer also showed signs of trichomoniasis, and the men who had it were more likely to have advanced tumors. Still, experts are reluctant to draw a link between the two, but this new study gives even more ammo to the argument that prostate cancer and trichomoniasis could be related. According to this study, the parasite that causes trichomoniasis, trichomonas vaginalis secretes a protein that leads to inflammation and causes increased growth and invasion of both benign and cancerous prostate cells. So even if TRIC doesn't cause prostate cancer, this study suggests that men who already have it may experience a more aggressive form of it if they've previously been infected with TRIC. Which brings up another fascinating study that was conducted recently showing that prostate cancer can be sniffed out by dogs with near perfect yes. accuracy. This is amazing. Crazy. A team of researchers from Italy took urine samples from 677 patients, half of whom were healthy and half of whom had prostate cancer, ranging from low risk tumors to widespread cancer. They then had two specially trained dogs smell each patient's urine to see if they could detect the presence of cancer. And apparently they can. Both dogs correctly sniffed out the cancer patients with a combined accuracy of 98%, which is incredible. But how does it work? Well, it turns out that people with cancerous tumors secrete something called volatile organic compounds, or VOCs, in their urine, which evaporate into the air and produce a scent that's detectable by dogs. This isn't the first time dogs have been used to sniff out cancer. The University of Pennsylvania's vet school has a cute little dog named Tsunami that they claim can correctly detect ovarian cancer 90% of the time. And another study published in 2006 found that smelling a patient's breath allowed dogs to successfully detect both lung and breast tumors with an extremely high level of accuracy. And because VOCs aren't specific to any kind of cancer, dogs should hypothetically be able to sniff out any tumorous cancer. Still, scientists say it's a long way off before you'll see dogs roaming around hospitals, but the potential is definitely there. And if they find a way to harness it, then that could reduce the amount of unnecessary and potentially risky biopsies. I'll tell you one thing, I would much rather have a dog sniffing my urine than a doctor cutting out a chunk of my skin. But that's just me. What do you guys think? Should we be relying on our pets to diagnose us? Leave your thoughts in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching. All right, and the last STI we're gonna talk about today is pubic lice. It's passed by direct contact with the infected person or by infected sheets 
towels and clothing. Uh, the nickname for this disease is crabs. Um, so what happens is that the eggs uh, generally hatch after 3 to 14 days. So that constitutes the incubation period. Um, typical symptoms are itching, blue or gray spots, and insect or um, insects or nits in the pubic area. Um, other symptoms are that the person might notice that they have um, pinhead size blood spots on their underwear, and some people have no symptoms at all. So the diagnosis is a microscopic examination of the nits on the um, hair and uh, locating adult lice adhering to hair. So the treatment involves special creams, lotions, or shampoos that can be bought at drugstores. Um, some products require a prescription, while others don't uh, require a prescription at all. So there's really no danger to uh, pubic lice, other than it's kind of gross, um, and can, like I mentioned before, um, be very itchy. So um, to prevent getting the disease again, uh, the treatment of the sex partner is also necessary and clothing and bed sheets should be thoroughly cleaned because they can live 30 days on a host and 24 hours on objects. Um, one of the ways that people kind of deal with pubic lice is by shaving their pubic hairs. So we're going to watch a video now on um, why, like the results of, sha of shaving your pubic hair. Um, and it mentions um, kind of the benefits of doing that in terms of preventing um, or treating pubic lice. So before we watch that video real quick, about 3 million people are infected annually with pubic lice or crabs. Okay, so here's the video. After puberty, pubic hair begins to surround our external genitalia. But with hair removal and grooming becoming a popular personal practice, is it really the best idea to shave or wax down there? Or is a full bush the way to go? Humans lost most of their thick body hair around 70,000 to 120,000 years after the last ice age. But despite becoming mostly bare, we retained plentiful hair in our armpits and crotches, becoming the only mammalian species in the world to have long, coarse pubic hair. Researchers hypothesize that pubic hair sprouts after puberty as a visual signal to potential partners that one is ready to mate, while the bush itself acts as protection from friction during sexual intercourse. Another theory involves sweat. Humans have two types of sweat glands. One type secretes mostly water and salt, producing no odor, while the other apocrine glands are found specifically in the armpit and the pubic areas, and using the pubic hair follicles secrete fluids rich in proteins, lipids, and pheromones. When bacteria on the skin break down these molecules, you get body odor. We may have evolved to retain these hairs to trap pheromones to be wafted towards potential mates. This is further supported by the fact that women release different pheromones during ovulation, signaling fertility in order to become more attractive to others. But a study of over 1,000 students in America found that 96% of females and 87% of males had either partially or completely removed pubic hair within the past month. As pubic hair is coarse, the regrowth after any type of grooming can be irritating to the skin. In fact, 75% of people sorting out their pubes have experienced genital itching, and 40% have experienced a rash of some sort. Shaving and waxing can create hair that grows inwards instead of out to the surface, resulting in red and inflamed raised bumps. Interestingly, the incidence of pubic lice has actually decreased due to shaving and waxing. However, these practices can also create microscopic abrasions on the skin, which can become infected and even transmitted transmit a myriad of sexually transmitted diseases. It has been theorized that pubic hair removal also correlates directly with the rise of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and HPV infections. Even with infections put aside, the most common genital injuries reported in American emergency rooms are a direct consequence of pubic hair removal. At the end of the day, no matter what grooming trends are currently popular, there's no harm in growing that bush the way that nature intended. Before you go, we wanted to send a huge thank you to Thought Cafe for animating this episode for us. They have a fantastic channel that you should definitely check out. It's super creative and informative. Be sure to check them out and subscribe to their channel for more fun and educational content. Thanks for watching. Okay, so hopefully one of the things that you've kind of picked up on through this lecture is that most STIs are not life-threatening and are completely curable. Um, 
So what I would like for you to do is tell me three reasons why it's so important to get tested for STIs. Um, if you could just give me a sentence for each reason, that would be awesome for lecture activity number three. And that is all I have for you for this chapter. So don't forget to submit your lecture activities and complete the assignments associated with chapter eight. And we'll see you for the next lecture. Have a great day.